All right, so um, being an excellent citizen of the United States, I, uh, um, I, I tried to recruit various people to do this class, and nobody really wanted it. And then I said, fine, I'll do it. And then uh, as I got close, I thought, what did I sign myself up for? <laughs> so um, so uh, um, first of all, um, this is a range of passages that you could say tell us not to obey government. And so um, Exodus 1 would be like the edict to kill the baby boys in Egypt. And the uh, midwives don't comply. And God blesses them, it says, because they don't do that. Daniel 3 is um, worship this image. And uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, uh, we don't even need to think about this. We're not going to fall down to an idol. Um, Matthew ten eighteen. I forget what that one is. Um, uh, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. So presumably, if you're being dragged before the governors and kings to bear witness for the sake of Jesus, presumably it's because you've been um, telling about Jesus when they told you not to. Uh, similarly, Acts 4 and 5 is um, Peter and some of the other apostles and where they give them strict orders not to speak in the name of Jesus. And they say, we must obey God rather than men. But then we have uh, these other passages about um, obeying um the government. Um, and um, so um, 1 Samuel uh, 24, 6 is David um, in the cave, and um, they say, Saul, Saul comes into this cave where David's hiding, and his men say, here's your chance. You can nab him and kill him. And he says, uh, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, Saul, the Lord's anointed, to put my, out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So he's saying, and this is, David was anointed a long time ago by Samuel, and yet it's very clear in David's mind, God put this man in, into leadership role. It's not my place uh, to get rid of him. Um, um, Proverbs uh, 24, 21 is, uh, as I've thought about these things, it's been very helpful to me. So I'll read that. Proverbs 24, 21 says, My son, fear the Lord and the king. Right in the same breath. Fear the Lord and the king. And do not join with those who do otherwise. And it's a, um, it's a difficult... Um, the last part is... is the. Translators struggle a little bit to translate the Hebrew there. Um, probably a good translation would be um, join with those who do otherwise would be join with rebels. Do not join with rebels. Um, then you have um, Acts 25.8, which is the same book as the We Must Obey God Rather Than Men. Um, yeah, go ahead. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Okay, so nothing wrong against Caesar as well as against those religious authorities of the day. Um, Romans 13, 7, pay taxes to all who owed them. Taxes, uh, sorry, pay to all who owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue, respect to whom respect, honor to whom honor. As far as like the respect and honor, I think uh, an example we could relate to is um, in the courtroom when the judge comes in. What do we do? We all stand. Mm -hmm. And this includes if you don't like the judge. Uh, and some of us have had experiences maybe of judges who don't have a good reputation. Uh, but you stand because of the office, not necessarily because of the individual. Um, and then uh, 1 Peter 2.17. Does anyone have that handy? 2.17? Yep. <laughs> it's technology. Yeah. Um, 
Fair enough. I think this is it. Yep. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Okay. So, uh, honor the emperor. Um, so, which is it? So these verses don't obey. These verses that do obey. So here's uh, here's what I think the answer is. Matthew 22 and verses 17 through 21. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me a coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they say, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. Um, so, um, you know, on our bills, we have George Washington and so on, and, and they, they have the face of the Caesar on their coins. Um, so, pay to Caesar what Caesar, to God what is God's. So, what belongs to the government? Taxes. Obedience to various regulations, you know, posted speed limits, uh, you know, all these wonderful things uh, are uh, things the government has said. Uh, I think I see a question brewing there. No, no, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking what else belongs, service and things along the Yeah, way. yeah, so I, yeah, um, so we have these, these various things, uh, and then respect, as we talked about. Now, what belongs to God? What belongs to God is our souls, our absolute final obedience and so uh, we worship no one else but God and so that does not belong to Caesar uh, our worship uh, and so if if ever the two are pitted against each other we go with God rather than with men and so that's you know in the Acts passages we must obey God rather than men that's when the leadership is telling you what God just told you to do to proclaim to all nations don't do that and they're saying, well, God takes precedence over you. So we obey government wherever we can. Um, but, um, but then uh, God is, is the, the final authority. Um, you know, now, you know, maybe to be clear, there's, there's, um, uh, we also have responsibility to our families. Um, uh, a man who doesn't care for his own family is worse than an unbeliever. We need to take care of our families and so on. And so, um, like in Connecticut, the the uh, average driving speed of a real life car on the road is about twenty miles above the posted speed limit, and there's often not a lot of space. And so, uh, I typically drive above the speed limit in Connecticut because I don't want to crash my car. Because <laughs> if you're driving so slow and people aren't expecting that, they kind of come right up on you. And I think my government understands that. <laughs> so uh, so um, there is uh, there is a thing called common sense. And, and as far as how the laws play out, that, that does. Then again, we don't want to make excuses, do we? Uh, you know, so I think that's a valid, you know, depending on road conditions and so on. Uh, but at the same time, um, should we just make excuses and come up with some reason why I'm not going to obey such and such a law? So it, I'm saying if there's really a legitimate safety concern, something like that, but otherwise we don't, you know, we shouldn't be the ones to pick, are we? Because our, you know, we our loyalty is to God and to His Word, and the Bible tells us to obey the government and to honor and so on. Um, um, the the um, here's 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 um it's the next paragraph. One might object, and I've I've heard this objection, that as American citizens, our loyalty is to the United States Constitution, which was promulgated as the supreme law of the land, along with some people sometimes forget any treaties. Uh, entered into and laws enacted in pursuance thereof. But it said that the argument goes, our loyalty is to the Constitution, some people say. Our loyalty is to the Constitution. And the, the government is flaunting that law every day. There's all sorts of things you know, being done in our country that are not constitutional, uh, at least on a 
literal interpretation or strict interpretation or whatever. So, are we justified then in rebelling against the government? And are our Christians who at least contemplate these things of uh, taking up arms against the government or running away from it? Um, but um, here's, a, here's a couple things. One is um, the verse from Proverbs, Fear God and the King, and do not associate with rebels. Uh, I think that's a pretty strong, if, if you've got someone who's, who's part of a, um, um, what's the word, a militia, um, uh, um, or, you know, something like that, um, I would be very wary about being buddy-buddy with them. Um, and uh, sometimes it's awkward because they might be relatives. <laughs> but uh, um, so, but just I mean, be careful because that's what that proverb says, doesn't it? We should be care- We should be cautious. Uh, and um, and here's another thing: is um, um, if we if we question the legal basis for much of what our government does as far as its constitutionality. Here's a question. What was the legal basis of the office and execution of Caesar in Paul's day? How legal was it for Nero at the time to be Caesar? Um, and I'm no expert on Roman history, but from you know my reading, it's, it's highly, it's at best, <laughs> highly dubious that uh, the Caesars of Paul's day were really had a firm legal basis coming out of the Roman Republic. Uh, the, basically, what happened was the Republic broke up into a series of civil wars, and then the people said, um, we need somebody to make, make order out of this chaos. Uh, and historically, when my, my history teacher at school said, people will... Human beings can tolerate disorder for only so long. And then they will turn to someone, anyone, Saddam Hussein, to create order out of chaos. Napoleon. The French Revolution was, in some ways, an attempt to bring the American Revolution to France. It resulted in chaos. Heads rolling, literally, through the streets. And so, eventually, they turned to Napoleon to someone be our leader, someone tell us what to do. And it's, it's, I mean, it's, in all these cases, the truth is very complicated, and, and the Roman case is complicated. In fact, they pretended they were still a republic for centuries. They still had a senate for centuries after it was really a functioning institution. I suspect a similar thing will happen in the United States, where in effect we will be a sort of limited monarchy, but we'll pretend we're still a republic, we'll still have a senate, and so on. But even if that's the case... Monarchy or dictatorship? Um, I'm not sure if, uh, like, I, I don't, I mean, I'm no prophet on these things. Well, um, just the but, difference between the two, a monarchy represents a family line and things like that, you're, you're saying. Well, I, well, okay, so I didn't mean monarchy in terms of, a, of, a, um, of, of uh, like, a dynasty. Mm-hmm. But monarchy in the sense of um, the chief executive basically says how it's going to be. Uh, and, um, but but probably not an unlimited monarchy, probably a limited monarchy. And it might be that he's basically the monarch for the next four years. Monarch we, we elect him through, through election. Yeah. And then within certain, um, you know, actually every king in history has operated under constraints. Because if, if, if you're the king, you know, there's nine million of them and one of you. So if you tell them what to do and they don't like it, you know, how are you going to stop them? Well, I'm the king, I say so. Well, what if they decide to throw you out the window? <laughs> so every king operates under constraints. And U.S. presidents will continue to have certain constraints. You know, the broad will of the people, that the American people simply will not stand for whatever. And so they know not to try that. Or, there might, you know, it probably will be a long time that the Senate and the Congress in general still has some power over the purse and, and whatever. But the larger point is... Um, I'm not sure that there was a good legal basis for the Caesarship coming out of the Roman Republic. But Paul did not object on those grounds. You do not find Paul saying, look, Caesar's unconstitutional. 
you know, the, the, the Roman Constitution says uh, Caesars are to be at a temporary post. It makes no provision for a bloodline. But what do we see here? Look, guys, you know, we, our loyalty is to the Roman Republic, not to the Caesar. But he says, um, honor the Caesar in, in very clear terms. So uh, even as uh, our uh, operation of government moves further and further away from the Constitution, I don't think that gives us a basis for saying we must not obey that the government. Um, the government is, you know, the, the power, like it or not. Here's here's another here's another argument along those lines. Um, the um, nation of the, the Jewish people in Jesus's day, when he's asked about the coin, in Paul's day still, was under foreign occupation. The Romans. They're not Jews, you know, and they're not even from the area. They're from way across in Italy. It's, they're under foreign occupation. But Jesus did not say, we're under occupation by an enemy, and, you know, therefore we're, you know, we're all rebels, we're all at war or whatever. Uh, he said, pay taxes to Caesar. And, and there seems to be, in Scripture, this base, there seems to be a, like a basic recognition of this is the way things are, like it or not. And it's not just these are the way things are, like, oh, it was all happenstance. Actually, if you were to probe a bit further, God raises up kings and he puts them down. And so, like, David's attitude towards Saul, this is the Lord's anointed. He's not living for the Lord. Saul, at that point, was, you know, horrendously, horrendously opposing God. And yet the fact remained, God put him in this position. Um, so... Like some of our, if, if our tax dollars are going towards things we don't like, does that give us a right not to pay taxes? Well, Paul says, um, pay taxes to Caesar in Romans. Pay taxes to whom taxes are due. How, were those, how is that tax money being used <laughs> by the Roman government for some wicked, wicked things? But it's not, you know, we're not the ones spending the money. It, that's not our responsibility. We're not responsible for how other people, you know, do that. God will hold them accountable for what they do with what passes through their hands. We're accountable for our role, and part of our role is to be obedient, and submissive uh, to those under our charge. Now, I did, I did mention, you know, the case of uh, providing for your own family, and I think of, um, in terms of uh, persecution, like we hold martyrs in high regard as well. We should. But what does Jesus say when they persecute you in one city, flee to another? And that's exactly what Paul did. And Paul was not scared of cat. But when he found out there was a plot to kill him in one city, he would leave and go to another. And in his case, the process would repeat. But it, we don't try to be killed. Okay, So it is a good thing to be, it's a, a noble thing to die for the sake of the name. But that's not the goal in itself. So if we can live, we do, if we can flee on. So with, with that in mind, suppose we were Syrians and we lived in Syria and literally our government is trying to kill us. Bombs are falling, gas. What do we do? Um, it's a tough, <laughs> uh, I'm glad I'm not in that role. I'm sure God would give wisdom, you know, and special grace for that special circumstance. In general terms, standing where I stand in America from a safe distance, you know, here's what I would say is, if you can run away, that's what I would say, if you can run away, if your government is trying to kill you, um, I, I would not advise joining a rebel group and fighting against the government if you can run away, you know, and maybe if you can't hide. Now, if, if you've got... Um, you know, like Alawite militia or government soldiers or Russian soldiers coming through the streets and they're going to shoot your family and you have a gun, I think maybe there's the place where you can say, I'm going to use my weapon to defend my family. Um, but that's a little bit different from joining a rebel group, isn't it? And, you know, carrying out offensive operations, trying to capture territory from the government. So you should try to run away. Yeah. And so should we as uh, Christians in America petition our government? To receive those refugees? Um, um, I, yeah, I think, um, I think, you know, now, so now we're getting into policy, and so this is difficult. 
because how so, America, how Christians but, should yeah, so, look at policy. Yeah, so um, um, the the tricky part is as as even as the United States, currently the mightiest nation on earth, um, we cannot take care of the entire world, and so. Um, if you say we're going to take care of the Syrians today, well, what about the Ugandans tomorrow and so on? But I, but I, but my heart wants to say, why can't we let Syrians come here? Why can't we? We've got a lot of room in the Midwest <laughs> for settlement, uh, and uh, you know we've been a refuge, and and we those are things we believe in. Why can't we? So I want to say yes. Um, I'm not a policy maker. I don't. I'm not in the congressional budget office to know what can we afford, uh, what can. But, but I really and I. It kills me. I remember. I remember years ago reading. Um, this is back when American reporters could still kind of be in Syria, apart from where they kind of sneak into the northern border things now. And um, but the war was definitely underway, and. Um, and uh, I know what it was. It was uh, because um, this the reporter was with a Syrian family, kind of in hiding, and and uh, and and the question was like, you know, why don't you guys do something one way or the other? You know, just pick what are you gonna do? And the reporter said, well, it's an election year, <laughs> and so we can't really commit to anything right now. And the and the 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 lady Syrian lady was just stunned for a moment yeah. to say anything. And then she said, then she, her eyes hardened and she said, we won't forget this. And, you know, so the, the Syrian people are going to remember <laughs> years from now, they're going to remember Middle Eastern people have much longer memories than Americans do. And <laughs> they will remember that we didn't help and we could have, we could have, but we didn't. It seems, that, and I don't want to belabor it, but it just seems that our traditions and our history mm -hmm. and our core values as a nation have been inclusive of bring us those people. Yes, and uh, and and a related point would be that as Americans, um, um, we are um, um, in the American Christians are in grave danger of. Um, of imbibing some of the American ideas that are not good. There are many American ideas that are good. Some American ideas are not good. And among those American ideas that are not good is that black people are inferior, uh, or that if they're not inferior, at least they should keep their distance, live in their own communities and be away from us, uh, or that Middle Eastern people just can't be trusted uh, and uh, we need to be very careful as Americans that our the technical term is ethnocentricity, that our ethnos, meaning our our people, our white national um, ethnic kind of group, is the center of the world. It all revolves around us and everybody else, kind of. Um, so um, now that is a good question, and that's part of why I was nervous about this class. Is there's just there's so many. There's so many uh, hard questions about should we be petitioning our government for these things, and I will I will get into a little bit of a little bit I, a little bit of how should we what's our relationship with with um, civil participation? Yeah, I would say like our relationship to elected officials petitioning uh, that sort of thing. Uh, in fact, that's my next. Oh. <laughs> okay. Here we are. Um, so here, are the, um, the the this is not something. So the Bible is sufficient. Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen. The, the Bible is inspired, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So the Bible tells us everything we could need to know. Sometimes we have to work at it because sometimes things are stated very directly for us about what we should or shouldn't do. Other times. It's not stated directly in this sort of situation, what do you do? So you have to figure out what are the biblical principles that would apply in the situation. Paul did not live in a democracy, so he had no reason to say, here's how you handle the ballot box, here's how you handle you know, petitions and referendums and so on. Uh, so what principles can we bring in here? So here are some things I thought of, maybe you can think of things I didn't uh, think of. Um, the first 
the first dash there, biblical modes of communication must be employed. Uh, so, um, I, I was at a, 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 a um, pastor's conference recently, a large, large gathering, and one of the speakers was, I forget the text, but it was something about scoffing. And he, he says something like, this is for all of us on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so Twitter, Facebook, um, uh, 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 you know, Instagram, all these things. Um, this is where this is uh, this uh, uh, somehow I think there has gotten into our heads this idea that if it's online, if it's social media, um, tone doesn't matter, or um, you know, things that you would never say in person. Sometimes people will say in social media, I think. Um, and so that should not be the case. We should be the same. We should exercise the same um, tone, the same uh, respect towards people we're talking to. Um, uh, so um, I've got a list of uh, verses there um, about using our tongues, being a soft. A soft answer turns away wrath. Thinking about things before we say things. Um, in the James, in James um, 3, 9 through 10, all men are created in the image of God. That includes unsaved people. Um, so you're talking to somebody whom you deeply disagree with on, on politics or whatever. You deeply disagree with them, but they are made in God's image. And so they must be treated with respect because this is somebody that God has created. You always bear that in mind. Um, Next point in terms of civil participation, um, a biblical view of humanity and along with that the means and circumstances of Christ's return should be borne in mind. To spell that out a bit, um, places like John 3.19, Romans 3.9-19, Ephesians 2.2, um, humanity is dead in its sin. And we're basically bent against God. We... we we're full of wickedness and slander and, and evil. So, when you crowdsource that, what do you get? When you get a, a bunch of people involved in something, you have a bunch of sinners involved in something. Um, so, um, one, of the, one of the ideas that's very popular, one, one of the ideas that's very distinct to our nation and the idea spreading around the world is that um, people are basically good and that if we all just get together and talk it out, eventually we'll come to the right solution. But that's leaving God out of the picture. Um, so if, if, we have, if we have an unrealistic, that's a nice picture of history that gradually, um, listen to John Meacham was on NPR the other day and he was talking about historians talking about um, President Trump as you know, as as, a, as just terrible in his public discourse and and, uh, and inciting divisions among people and so on, uh, and so John Meacham just really is is very very anti-Trump, and yet he concluded the interview by saying, "But history marches on, and history always brings us from darkness to light, and so we will one day look back on Donald Trump as an aberration." Like, it was sort of a fluke, but things are going to get better, he says, because that's the march of history. That's the voice of reason. Well, what if, what if it's not? <laughs> what if people are not basically good? Um, but if we approach politics with the idea of if we can just get a lot of people to agree. So I'm not saying that because most people are sinners that, you know, the, the uh, pronouncement of the majority is always wrong. We should just withdraw from society. I'm not saying that. But we should just have a realistic view of the public. How, how well does the public understand the public's good, if that makes sense? Does, does the mass of people really know what they really need? <laughs> they think they know what they need, but are they accurate in what their needs really are? Uh, and one justice really would be. And then um, when we think of, along with that, when we think of the means and circumstances of Christ's return, um, long story short, um, what the Bible tells us is things are going to get worse before they get better. Which means that we should not have an idea of if we can just improve society enough by voting in the right 
people and voting in the right laws and creating the, the right kind of public discourse and, and so on and so on, then things will be good because that's not what the Bible presents. Um, Christ is not going to return because things have gotten so very good. He's going to return in a time of great tribulation and trial and trouble, uh, and he will restore things that you know we, we uh, have not been able to. So, uh, to summarize this point, um, fallen man will only get so far in constructing a, um, um, a, a, I think I meant a just comma civil society, uh, and our efforts at societal improvement will not bring about millennial conditions. Um, the next thing is that things are um, seen or temporal, 2 Corinthians 4.18, which you always keep in mind, this is the here and now, it's not the forever. And it's the forever that matters. So everything we see right now going on, this is temporary, which could be pretty reassuring at times <laughs> when things don't look so great in our country and around the world. Um, man made in the image of God is worthy of respect. I mentioned that already. Um, where is it? it is obtainable, freedom is desirable. And there's some scripture texts that would point in that direction. Um, where it's obtainable, freedom is desirable. So, um, so I think there you can start to get a little more tangible in terms of uh, of policy. Is that um, we should be cautious about laws that restrict and 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 and, and um, overregulate. Um, and as a, and I'm not saying no regulation. Because that would be chaos, <laughs> uh, and uh, lead to a lot of bad things. Because there's bad people out there who will take advantage of others, or people who just won't think and dump their toxic waste in the river, and the people downstream has to have to deal with it. But um, Scripture several times says, if you can have freedom, that's that's good. And so we we want to promote um, openness. We want to promote free discussion. Um, you know forums of dialogue, participation, um, um, and, uh, and not um, obsessive control. So I don't have a clear, in maybe a sense, I don't have a real clear fleshed out picture of what exactly this would look like. Uh, but that does seem to be a scriptural principle that could apply to political discussions is where it's possible freedom over slavery is desirable. Um, the earth mandated to man by God is to be managed carefully. Um, and so um, we're not to worship the earth. Um, and people are more important than animals and plants uh, and the atmosphere. <laughs> uh, but um, Genesis chapter 1, God was given this God, God gave this planet to mankind, and we have a responsibility to, uh, to care for it. Uh, and so um, we need to put thought and intentionality uh, into that um, as we're uh, careful not to pollute where it can be avoided, uh, not to pollute, to uh, deal with our waste um, thoughtfully. Uh, you know, if we just... You know, how many landfills can there be filled with all sorts of uh, uh, stuff that will never disappear where we could, you know, recycle? So I'm not saying become a recycle freak, and, um, but um, I think that is a scriptural principle that plays into our politics is uh, the earth is something God gave us to uh, be responsible for. Um, Acts of servanthood are to be sought rather than name recognition. It's certainly a biblical principle. That's very important in um, the political realm as um, rather than name recognition and uh, all that. Uh, we, want, uh, we want to be servants. And the kind of political people would be attracted to our um, servant-like uh, people. I, um, I'm not sure if I want to say the name or not of a of a politician. This this a politician a while ago who, not a president, <laughs> uh, who um, who um, who a lot of his policies I liked. 
um, you know, not all of them, but, but I thought, as, you know, looking at the overall picture, uh, I like a lot of these policies. But there was something about the guy that just came off as, as like, he, he's better than we are, or he just, he knows. And, and it was, it was, you know, it was kind of off, off-putting. And um, I think I did vote for him in the primary, but uh, um, he didn't make it to the, the uh, end, so I didn't have to. <laughs> Is it Kasich? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, Is this last Ted one? Cruz. Huh? Ted Cruz. Okay. Yes. Very off-putting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that brings us to what shall we say about President Trump? And this is why I tape, turn off the tape recorder. No. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Leave it in. <laughs> Do I really want to be caught on record saying something? <laughs> okay. So, um, so what shall we say as Christians about President Trump? Um, first of all, he's not our savior, and it's um, it is disturbing to see Christians um, join with some elements of wider American society in thinking that somehow he's the guy who's going to set things straight, or he would set things straight if the media would just let off him for half a moment, or or whatever. Uh, if you know if there wasn't such a swamp to begin with, and he could actually do what he wanted to do, he would set everything straight. Jesus is our savior, <laughs> and, and uh, no one else, certainly not President Trump. So we should not be con confused about that. Um, on the other hand, he should be an object of respect because of his office. Again, like a judge you would stand for. He is president of the United States of America. And so he he's uh, to be an object of uh, respect. So I was convicted in in um, the primary days uh, when my coworker likes to coworkers likes to po talk politics, uh, and uh, he tends a little bit towards like the gossipy end of things and so on. Um, but but I sort of enjoyed laughing about um, uh, you know what if Donald Trump became president. We'd be at war with Mexico. We'd be at war with China. Um, the um, the uh, well, <laughs> I shouldn't say. All <laughs> the point is, <laughs> the, the point is, uh, I was convicted at a certain point. Um, I should not be mocking someone, uh, and in particular, um, I, I, uh, if he, you know, I mean, if he becomes president. He is uh, someone to whom honor should be given, fear should be given. And just as much as, I mean, if we were contemporaries of Paul, none of us would be fans of Nero. But he, we would have been told by, by our pastors, we need to respect Nero and, and pray for him and so on. So um, because, um, because, uh, um, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe think I'm a liberal, but, uh, I don't really, I'm not really a don't big fan. Of, <laughs> so I'm not a big fan of, uh, President Trump. Uh, and there are things about him that, that, uh, upset me, irk me, um, sometimes amuse me in a dark, twisted kind of way. And, um, and, uh, so because of that, <laughs> I try hard to always refer to him as the president or President Trump or something like that to, and, and I, you know, and I don't want to get like, you know, pharisaical of like, you didn't say President Trump, you're not being respectful, <laughs> but so I don't want to, I don't want to go, but for me, I try to say, try to refer to him as the president. And that reminds me of his office and that he, he deserves respect. Um, in that regard. I mean, uh, Paul literally challenged the government after he was arrested. Um, and, and he had every right to because he was a citizen as mm -hmm. well. Um, that seems, to, in my mind, to play a central role in this conversation. If you look at Paul, you look at the teaching of Jesus around our relationship with government, and then you look at the behavior of the disciples around that. And, and how does that pertain to our perception and our actions because Paul stood up mm -hmm. and said you, you weren't supposed to, he could have just left because they told him get out of here and he said no, you guys 
didn't do this right, and he ended up going yeah, yeah. through court after court. And yeah. Pastor and I talked about this, and I'm like, that was God's divine will to get the message of Jesus Christ all the way up to that level. Mm-hmm. At the same time, he did stand up to government mm-hmm. in what what's, appears to be a totally legal way, mm-hmm. and certainly a way that was honoring. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, there's some pretty interesting stuff there. So, like Paul could be feisty at times. It's yes, he could. <laughs> yeah. Um, Last thing on, uh, or no, sorry, two more things on uh, President Trump is his policies are good in some respects, um, and we could be here the rest of the weekend talk, you know, talking about well, which ones are the good ones and which are the bad ones. But I'll say, I'll say, <laughs> I'll say his policies are good in some respects, but no Christian should be caught condoning his unchristlike behavior. And I, I, again, it's, I have seen Christians condoning unchristlike behavior from him, and that's not, that should not be. We must not confuse those around us, in, in the world in particular. Don't let the world be confused. We are not basically Trumpians. And that's true even if you personally are in favor of, like, most of his policies or all of his policies. Um, don't let anybody think you're a Trumpian rather than a Christian. Mm. Um, odds and ends, we're to be salt and light, mm-hmm. not hermits. Uh, and that's the temptation for some, um, is to be hermits. Keep in mind what's most important, things like justice and mercy. Um, and I think of the Syrians in that regard. Mm-hmm. Is what you, um, beware of activism in the pulpit. Um, we preach Christ crucified, not politics, not uh, President Trump or anybody else. Uh, wrap up, pay your taxes. To be an excellent citizen, pay your taxes. Um, uh, don't cheat on them. <laughs> um, obey those in authority wherever you can. Um, speak with respect of and to those whose office requires it, even Democrats. Uh, I, I pondered it, you know, if I ran into President Obama, what would I say? Uh, and, uh, um, you know, it would likely be a brief conversation if he's in Zebs or something. And, you know, I thought, I thought something like shake his hand and say, um, Mr. President, I don't agree with you on everything, but I pray for you. And, you know, a couple seconds, and hopefully that would make an impact for the Lord. Um, make a positive contribution to your community in word and deed. We should be people of mercy, people concerned about the poor, the outcasts, the, the downtrodden, um, and uh, justice and mercy. Those are some of the important things. Um, so don't be a hermit. Don't don't misunderstand that that you know, but that the world can fix itself, or that we can make everything better with the right policies and so on. But do make a positive contribution to your community. Um, and and it does seem to me that at the community level, perhaps is where some of the clearest of this can be seen. It, it, we become anonymous at a national level, even a state level to a large extent. The community level, they see you, they see you in the bank, they see you in the gas store, they see you at work, and, the, and that can, then your actions can speak. Pray for peace would be a, a political uh, item from First Timothy 2.2. 2. Um, if employed by the government, serve honorably. And this is basically what John the Baptist says when various people, um, including soldiers, were baptized by him, and they say, um, what's this look like for us? to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He says, well, don't, uh, don't, uh, don't uh, abuse your status to take things from people. Um, be fair. Be content with your wages. Uh, and uh, so basically serve honorably. Other questions or comments? Well, when you look at that idea of... Uh, social concern, social awareness. You look at the, the poor and the downtrodden. Mm-hmm. And you, you mentioned our action at the local level. Should that also reflect our action and who we select or believe represents those things? Yes, yeah, so that's that's a um, you know, privilege that we have that Paul didn't have is we can vote for people. Mm-hmm. And so what sort of people should we vote for? And ideally, people who reflect um, these... Uh, values. Um, let me ask you guys a question, because I'm still learning. See if you've thought of something I have in this regard. Um, the last couple of presidential elections, 
uh, I either voted for nobody or I wrote somebody in um, because the Republican candidate was, I thought, squishy on abortion. Um, so President Trump, um, when um, the, um, uh, I hate to call him the Mormon guy, but I can't think of his name. Is it Romney? <laughs> Romney. Romney. Um, so I was, yeah, I was kind of torn. And so, you know, when you, when you're voting for, um, here's, here's, here's where, here's where I've gone with it is when I, when I put down this man's name, I'm saying, I approve this man. I'm giving my approval for this man. Other people would say, well, it's, you know, you're given these choices, mm -hmm. you know, A or B, which one? And of the two, I would have preferred Romney, um, to President Obama, um, so should I have voted for, you know, Romney so that it was a vote for him and, you know, so what, what do you guys think? I'm saying it's not what we think, but is, uh, that really matters, but is there scripture you can think of, scriptural principles? I see the wheels turning, so that's, that's, that's good. I'm going to let the guy, kids, the young and stuff. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm not a voter, but looking like this election, you know, the two choices we had, neither of them are great, but do you want someone who is actively against everything we would stand for, or someone who is not necessarily actively against, and if you have a chance to get that other person into office, you know, I, I think that would be uh, valid biblically. So you you, you choose lesser two the, the lesser two evils or the um, right? Yeah, the yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking because it like in this election it came down to bad and less bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I I understand what you're saying about you know the approval and I wouldn't say that I would agree, you know, with everything going on and past elections with all the candidates, but I, I would say that, um, you know, one of the candidates is literally actively against God and against those principles. Yeah. Is it, it's, um, is it, is, is it, here's a, here's a, like, related question is, um, um, is it, um, is it a, a Christian duty to vote? You know, it's a, that is the same question I'm fighting right now for the last few years. So, yeah, I mean, are we not disobeying if we don't vote? I, I do not believe we're disobeying at this point. I believe that everything you talk about that seem grassroots reflects the disciples, the actions of Paul. They lived the testimony that represented Christ. Uh, Jesus said, render unto. Now, if, if voting is a part of rendering, mm -hmm. um, I think that's the conversation. Um, I'm not aware of a law, you know, you, you must, you know, you must vote. Um, originally, the voter, yeah, is it a, is it a, a yeah, is it a, uh, is it a moral imperative? Is it a societal expectation that, um, I know we're over time, but they're still talking. It's, it's a social yeah. imperative. It's a so it's not, but not. I don't know how to make it. I, I, I'm so qu I question the whole word. Have you gotten those emails that. from Deborah Cleaver? On, on, uh, I get them from every side. The, 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 yeah. Well, it's it's a uh, it's it's this it's this thing like see who in your neighborhood did or didn't vote. Yeah, that, and that's, and that's, I looked at mine and it wasn't even accurate. I I did vote and it says I didn't, and so that makes me mad. I'm being misrepresented. <laughs> <laughs> Not a whole lot of truth out there in the whole process anymore. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I love the conversation. I really do. Um, I, I don't know that a, a true Christian can make it through the political process anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, to at least at the national level. I'm not even sure at the state level. I, I, I mean, I know a solid Christian in the state of Maine mm -hmm. who's made it to the Maine House. Mm -hmm. 
and I know that uh, you know he's got firm convictions and things. I know he also is very frustrated. I, I think the only way it would happen would be literally divine intervention, literally, yeah. because the minute you make a stand, a scriptural stand, on something like abortion, you're going to see your entire world attacked by another side, and even within its own party to some level, um, for being, and you've heard people say, I believe this, and then boom, they're done. Yeah. They're done, and yeah. they're attacked, they're lied about, and all those things. I, here's, here's One thing I was thinking is, not just about voting, but uh, you mentioned like civil responsibilities, I think that's how you said it. Um, it almost, like, not just voting in general, but should Christians participate in government, um, it almost sounds like uh, to say we shouldn't almost sounds like a pacifist argument as far as war. Um, and I would say as responsible Christians, no, we can't fix anything, but I would say we do have a responsibility, um, you know, to fight for those things. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And Which would include voting. Here's something that would complement that. So a little different thought, but go alongside of it. Here's here's something I think that should comfort us: is uh, we're only responsible for the things God puts under our responsibility. Um, so um, it can be easy because we, you know, we we all care about our nation, and I think that's reflected in our being here. We care about our nation, and so it bothers us when we see certain things happening or not happening and so on. Um, but we should not fret about things that are not under our control. We have very little impact, any one of us, on what happens. Even if, like, everyone in this conference here were to, like, form a block and vote together, <laughs> what influence would we have, you know, at the national level? That's out of our control. God will take care of that. Yeah. What, but our main, and I'm not disagreeing with participation at, at, you know, the higher levels, the voting and so on, but our primary... Um, intersection with politics in our nation is at the community level. And if our community has no idea who we are, um, and uh, so uh, as individuals and as, and as churches, and yes, as churches, we need to be very cautious about confusing people as, as far as are you a, an aid society, are you a, um, you know, whatever. So we do need to maintain that distinction. But if the community has no idea uh, that this church exists, um, and then we, as individuals that comprise a local church body, we need to be contributing to uh, our communities in a way that displays God's mercy, right. God's kindness, God's concern for the poor. That's right. So we need it in our lives to, to make those things tangible.